OK, I think we'll make a start. Um, hello, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this uh, European Alliance for Apprenticeship webinar. Uh, my name's Andrew McCoshan, and I'll be your moderator for the next 90 minutes. Um, for those of you who haven't been to one of these AFA webinars uh, before, uh, it's one of the services offered uh, as part of the Apprenticeship Support Service, and they're designed to provide a, a shared space so we can bring together experts, uh, and in this case, apprentices and, and companies and other stakeholders um, on to discuss specific um, topics, um, to share experiences and hopefully to um, support uh, mutual learning and to learn about key issues. Uh, the topic of today's event is uh, the very important one of mobility in apprenticeships, uh, and it's uh, it's very interesting to uh, reflect on the fact that actually, in terms of how we got here today, um, we've got actually 30 years history of uh, mobility in vocational education and training uh, in general. And over the years, um, we've seen various developments uh, to, to improve the quality uh, and attractiveness of mobility uh, experiences for people in vocational education and training and uh, over the last decade or so, particularly with a focus on uh, apprentices. Uh, it's become indeed a key priority at EU level, and in a moment I'll be delighted to give the floor to colleagues at the European Commission who will be able to give you uh, some background um, on um, the flagship initiatives and other policies um, that have been put in place. Um, an interesting aspect is that despite the accumulation of um, policies and practices over the years, um, we can still observe um, challenges and bottlenecks in relation to how to change to turn the theory of mobility for apprentices into into practice. And really, that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Um, we've assembled for you uh, an, an excellent panel um, who will share their experiences from different perspectives, and we'll also give you some uh, information about uh, the mobility toolkit. Um, that's about to be launched as part of the uh, uh, European Alliance for Apprenticeships. In terms of our agenda, um, as I mentioned, I'll give the floor in a moment to colleagues from the European Commission. Then we intend to have uh, a panel discussion which we've structured into two rounds uh, to take you through the different um, steps that are involved uh, in mobility periods. Uh, and then we'll finish with um, by hearing from uh, EuroRap Mobility about they're really interesting and, and useful work in this area. So without further ado, um, I should introduce the housekeeping rules first before I turn to my European Commission colleagues. Uh, your microphone and camera will be turned off uh, all, at all times, um, but uh, please do use the chat to leave comments uh, and interact uh, with other participants during the event. Uh, the event will be uh, recorded, um, but if you have any technical issues, um, there is a, an email address there for messages which you can send through the chat uh, or contact us on that email address and we'll try and sort things out for you as best we can. So I'm very pleased to welcome Anna Carrero from DG Employment um, who will give us insights into the importance of mobility and current uh, EU initiatives. Anna, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EAFA's webinar. For those who are new to these webinars, just a, a quick word on EAFA. Um, I'm Ana Carrero, and I work as Deputy Head of Unit in the unit in charge of vocational education and training and apprenticeships. So we are in charge uh, of EAFA, which is the European Alliance for Apprenticeships, uh, a network where policymakers, companies, social partners, and other key stakeholders work together to have more and better apprenticeship programs while improving their image. So the Alliance is also a hub for knowledge sharing like today and a source of contacts to develop common projects. So this webinar is part of our activities planned for 2023, and I encourage you to stay tuned for, for other future activities. So one of the objectives of the Alliance is to increase apprentice mobility. As you may know, at EU level, we set a target for mobility of vocational education and training learners. Um, we want to achieve 8% uh, by 2025 as set in the 2020 Council recommendation. 
But now, very recently, we have proposed to update this target with a, an even more ambitious objective, achieving 15% of vet learner mobility by 2030 as part of the very recent proposal for a council recommendation, uh, Europe on the Move, Learning Mobility Opportunities for Everyone, which was adopted by the Commission on the 15th of November. So this council recommendation also includes an annex with a policy framework on a apprentice uh, mobility, so focusing uh, on, on apprentices. So this means that there is really a clear political support to make apprentice mobility easier on the ground. So basically, vet learners uh, mobility abroad happens less frequently than for higher education learners. And within vet, we see that apprentice mobility is even less frequent, even if the opportunity is already offered by Erasmus+. Plus. So we also know that it brings clear benefits to young people in terms of training, employability, also to companies as the skills of their workforce are broadened and to society as a whole, of course. But we know that they face very specific obstacles and that's why there is a need for this very specific focus. There are there is administrative uh, complexity due to the specific status of apprentices and the diversity of national apprenticeship programs. This means uncertainties and complexities in terms of pay, insurance and, and other aspects. Apprentices are often too young and hence face fears uh, or reluctancy towards learning mobility. And employers uh, may, may fear also the, the productivity loss of, of uh, allowing apprentices uh, going abroad. And there are also language barriers, so not easy. And this annex uh, in this proposal for council recommendation proposes some measures to member states um, that they can put in place to enhance apprentice mobility. So uh, these principles concern measures at system level, uh, other measures to support uh, apprentices through language preparation, complementary grants, uh, mentorship systems and, and other aspects, and also support to companies uh, through financial incentives incentives, intermediary networks and uh, promotion. So with the toolkit, uh, we will present a toolkit today, uh, which is a practical guide uh, that seeks making apprentice mobility easier for all these stakeholders, uh, apprentices, employers and training institutions and explaining all the necessary steps to undertake when organizing a mobility abroad. So this fits very well uh, in all these uh, contexts uh, and as a follow up of this proposal for council recommendation. And uh, before uh, giving the floor to my colleague in DGEAC, um, the 2024 Erasmus Plus program includes a call for proposals for the establishment and reinforcement of support structures and networks for apprentice mobility. So this call has been recently published together with other topics uh, under the policy experimentation calls, and it is open to organizations from education and training as well as uh, from the world of work. Deadline for applications is the 4th of June, and probably my colleagues will post uh, the, the, the link uh, in the chat uh, for your information. So I encourage you to check it out. And now I give the floor to my colleague Jacqueline uh, from DGEAC that will give you some more details on the recommendation and the Erasmus Plus program. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for this. Uh... Very nice introduction. Uh, so Jacqueline Paco speaking from DG EAC Education and Culture, responsible for the Airbus Masters program, including for vet and uh, adult education. So I will indeed comment a bit uh, on the opportunities provided by the Airbus Masters program in vet. Uh, first of all, the vet sector is the second largest uh, uh, budget in Erasmus plus, plus after higher education. Huh? In re it represents about one quarter of the budget, so we have some money for that. And uh, just to remind you that uh, according to the Erasmus Plus 2022 annual report, which was published a couple of days ago, 224,000 participants in the VET sector being staff, teachers and learners together, started a learning mobility abroad in 2022 with the support of the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, and um, among these participants, 87% were learners, meaning vet learners, uh, including, of course, uh, apprentices. 
So we don't know, we do not know yet exactly the share of our practices among these learners, but we know that under the previous Erasmus Plus program, this share of apprentices among vet learners participating in the Erasmus Plus program for mobility players abroad was around 20%. Um, so also to, uh, to inform you that out of the 2022 Erasmus Plus call, we know that 70% of mobility activities requested for co-funded in VET were supported. This figure demonstrates that there is some demand in VET and that the budget available makes it possible to address uh, uh, and to absorb the majority uh, of, the, of the requests. Um, but it's also important to note that grants are not sufficient to develop learning mobility further, in particular, indeed, for apprentices. There are still some structural impediments uh, for implementing these learning mobility periods abroad, and this is true for any education and training sector, not only for apprentices in VET. Of course, the obstacles are different for staff and for learners, and apprentices uh, face specific impediments, as Anna mentioned a couple of minutes ago. However, making learning mobility the norm rather than the exception is one of the main objectives of the European Education Area, the policy framework for education and training until 2025. And that's why the Commission adopted this proposal for a council recommendation called Europe on the Move. Uh, and the objective of this document is to remove the remaining obstacles to mobility for any kind of participants in any education and training sector. Once adopted by the Council of Ministers, probably during the first semester of 2024, the Commission will help Member States to implement this, this framework for mobility through exchanges of good practices and peer learning between representatives and experts from Member States. This process should, of, uh, of course, contribute to develop learning mobility further for learners, and in particular, vet learners, and in particular, apprentices, but also for staff and in particular for VET teachers. Uh, just to let you know that in addition to the specific annex focusing on apprentices, there is also a specific annex about the mobility of teachers, including VET teachers. However, in addition to what we can do with this council uh, recommendation to really mainstream mobility, in the VET sector, as it is also the case in the other sector, we will need a bigger budget for the next Erasmus Plus program, which will start in 2028. So just to conclude, I would like to remind the benefits of such experience of, of learning mobility abroad. From the 2022 annual report, we know that any sector included 98 Per percent of participants in an Erasmus Plus mobility would recommend this experience. The benefits from short-term mobility are, uh, of course, different from uh, those out of long-term mobility, but both kinds of mobility are very impactful uh, on learners and also on, on organizations especially for vet learners who may be less uh, used to, to travel. Um, such an experience provides more self-confidence, more maturity, and if, of course, the experience is long enough, may also help to improve foreign language competencies and acquire new specific skills. Um, voila, so I wish you a very fruitful uh, meeting because a very concrete tool like the, the, the toolkit that, that will be presented today is also absolutely uh, essential to develop mobility further in VET and more specifically for apprentices. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline, and also uh, thanks to Anna um, for those presentations. Uh, Really interesting and uh, thanks for keeping us on time as well. We're spot on time for the next session. So many thanks to both of you, very insightful.
Um, now we'd like to go into the next part of our agenda, which is the uh, panel discussion uh, element. But uh, before we do that, uh, we always like to uh, try and encourage a piece of a bit of uh, uh, engagement uh, with with you all uh, out there in cyberspace. And um, we've uh, we've got a poll for you, uh, and um, that'll appear in a moment. Uh, and we'd like like you to um, to vote on the poll. Um, which should be coming up soon, I believe, um, which is around the biggest challenges faced by um, employers uh, in offering mobility uh, opportunities. But I'm not sure whether we have a technical difficulty uh, in actually doing that or whether it's appeared in the chat. This is interesting because I don't seem to have the chat function, uh, which is interesting. So you have the opportunity to uh, to vote once um, on the topic. Um, and after you've uh, voted, could you please click um, to close um, the, the place where you're voting? And the poll will also be visible uh, in the chat, although Unfortunately, I don't seem to have access to that. So I don't know whether one of my colleagues would like to come in and uh, just re report on the results because I was uh, originally going to come in and uh, be able to. Thank you, Flavia. I can come in to, to the help rescue. You, Andrew. Thank you yes, very much indeed. on this. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't got chat, but I haven't. But there we are. <laughs> no problem. So the results are still um, coming in, but at the moment we have almost half of the uh, voters that have selected navigating national legal obligation and differences among countries as the uh, main challenge uh, to uh, to mobility. This is followed by having dedicated and experienced staff working mobility opportunities. Um, so these are the two that stand out, um, whereas preparing mobility agreements seem to be less of a challenge for the participants uh, today, as well as securing funding, which is, I guess, good news. Only 13% of the participants voted for, uh, for this one uh, and identifying and working with domestic and foreign partners. So it's mostly about um, making sure that the uh, staff in organizations is uh, experienced enough to be able to uh, uh, to work on mobility and uh, more than anything navigating legal um, obligations uh, and differences among apprenticeship systems that's thank all thank you thank you flavia that's that's really helpful um and that's i find that a very interesting result as you mentioned there, the, the funding um, element came low down the list, which was a, was a fear I had when uh, we decided to give you only uh, one choice, because often that comes near the top. But indeed, um, legal obligations are a, a challenge, and I think uh, uh, more so perhaps in this uh, the apprenticeship field than in than in other fields. Um, and um, and staff uh, the staff with experience of these topics is also a general issue that uh, we come across a lot. Uh, when we're trying to sort of improve the quality of mobility experiences kind of across across the pitch really not just in apprenticeships but in all aspect areas of education and training so thank you very much flavia uh, for leaping into the uh into uh, to, to help me out there and uh, i would now like to turn to the uh, the panel discussion so uh if uh, our panelists could turn on their cameras that would be wonderful um we have selected our, our wonderful panel uh, members uh, to provide you with um, different insights um, from the, the key stakeholders uh, involved in apprenticeships. Um, so uh, I'm very delighted to wel welcome Lena Muller, uh, who uh, is from a company called Software One, which I believe is a technology services company. I'm glad I got that right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Suzanne Klimmer. Uh, who may be familiar to to uh, a number of you, if not uh, many of you, um, as uh, she's managing director of IFA, the International Young Workers Exchange. I won't attempt to pronounce it in German uh, because that would become a linguistic car crash, I think. Um, and also uh, Giuseppina uh, Tucci, who's secretary general of OBESU, uh, which represents students and is also chair of the European Apprentices Network. So we have um, perspectives from 
employer side, apprentice side, and from uh, an intermediary organisation, uh, which uh, has an important role to play um, in oiling the wheels, uh, but much more than that. But we'll hear a little bit about a little bit more about that in a minute. And the the the, the questions we would like to focus on in this uh, initial session, we have two of those. The first is uh, what are the challenges faced by employers in offering and implementing mobility opportunities, uh, and which challenges are considered a priority. Um, and I think maybe we'll deal with that question first. Um, there's also a question on um, apprentices' needs and what the specific needs of apprentices might be uh, in order to be ready for and to be able to participate uh, in, in mobility periods. Um, so I thought I might start uh, um, with you, Suzanne, if, if that's OK, um, yeah. as someone who kind of, I don't know, you sort of kind of, you can say more about this, but you sit in between uh, apprentices and, and employers, don't you? So maybe you could give a little bit of background on your organisation and then and then um, give us your response to the first of those questions. Yes, sure. Thank you very much for the invitation and also for the introduction. My name is Susanne and I'm uh, working for IFA. As uh, Andrew already said, it's a, um, I would say it's a, a one-stop shop uh, support structure stakeholder intermediary organization, something like that, something in between everything and every organization in the field of mobility in Austria. It's an organization that was founded uh, when Austria entered the European Union, which is almost uh, 30 years ago. And the reason was it was founded by the economic chambers and the, the Ministry of Economy in Austria. And the reason for the uh, foundation of, of IFA was that uh, some, I would say, clever people already noticed that everybody will be um, invited to take part in European uh, projects, in European mobility, but uh, individuals are not able to apply on their own. And as the apprentices in Austria are very young, compared to many other countries, um, they will not be able to manage and organize their, their stays abroad on their own. And the Austrian companies, um, I mean, let's say we, we have some, some big industry companies, but most of the companies are small and medium-sized enterprise, uh, enterprises in the crafts and trade sectors. So they often do not have the contacts to, to um, uh, possible uh, placement companies in other countries, and they don't have the resources, they don't have the experience with European fundings and uh, organization of, of all that stuff. So this is our um, main task to enable people to participate in the European Union, especially apprentices from the dual system. And um, to be a bit more concrete, um, we heard uh, in uh, Anna's and, and uh, Jacqueline's uh, introductions already a lot about the challenges uh, that uh, the apprentices face. But um, in Austria, we have a traditional apprenticeship system, which is very similar to the German system. Um, it's a dual system where apprentices have a training contract with the training company and 80% of the training takes place in the company and they also attend a vocational school for apprentices. We have a kind of full profession concept still and it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the apprentices start at a very young age, let's say 15, 16, it's a bit increasing, some start with the, at the age of 17, but they are really young at, uh, uh, during their apprenticeship training. Um, and this means that uh, they are very, at a very young age, um, kind of productive workforce for the company. Um, they receive an apprenticeship income during their apprenticeship training. And this full profession concept means that it's a, it's a fixed duration of the training period. Um, and the challenge uh, to organize mobility in this case is that you have uh, two places of learning. Um, they are very young. It's not so easy to um, find countries and partners that uh, really um, accompany them during this uh, um, um, mobility period. Um, the company missed the workforce of the apprentices and they still have to pay, according to the Austrian law, the apprenticeship income to the apprentices, but miss the workforce at the same time. 
they often do not see the benefits in the first, uh, yeah, first first stage of this um, thinking about mobility, and they have a really big lack of information about support structures, about funding, about how how to organize, how to to get um, all those things, and um, I think it's really really important to to um, communicate about the benefits for the companies. Maybe we'll come to that uh, a bit later. Um, I think it's really important to talk to uh, talk about the benefits and show best practice examples of companies uh, to convince them that this is a really good chance also for the not only for the young people but also for their company and for their the training and the apprenticeship training. Uh, yeah, I, I, probably I make a, sh a stop at the moment if there are any questions or give the floor to another uh, panelist. This is okay. Nathan. Yeah, that's that's great, Suzanne. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I I mean, you you touched upon um some of the you know, with the key issue there of of, uh, of pay payment, uh, which is an important one for clearly within this whole um scenario we're looking at. Um, and it'll be interesting also to talk. Maybe you can come back a little bit later to, to talk about um uh, recognition in in your kind of apprenticeship system because those those recognition practices vary quite a lot across Germany yeah. uh, sorry across Europe um, and you, you have a specific situation in in Germany uh, and Austria mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe I could come to, to Lena next as well on the the company side of things um, what what do you see as the um, the key challenges here Lena yes thank you Andrew um, so nice for having thanks for having me here today um, I speak for companies today here um, from a software one side, maybe to give our audience a bit of an input where I come from. Um, I'm the apprentice lead for the region of EMEA, which includes Europe, Middle East and Africa. And at this side, I'm responsible for um, the structural side of the apprenticeship. Um, I sit in Germany, so I can relate to a lot of things Suzanne said right now. And I think we can have a great discussion on two of the things. But I wanted to pick up um, one of the first challenges I see from the employer side, and this is the personnel or just the human resources part of it. Um, so we at Software One, we have a talent team, which is out of about nine people. Um, we are a global company and we act nine people globally um, to set um, systems for young learners in the company. And this is something I see really um, as a challenge for small and medium sized companies to have the human resources to implement those those projects or those um, mobility um, opportunities. Um, so I myself work with the working students. So we're kind of like one and a half um, employee working on the apprenticeship scheme for Europe. Um, and I feel that in small and medium sized companies, there's not enough of human resources um, to take on these mobility um, opportunities. So luckily in Software One, we um, have came up with the um, human resources. It has not been there for every forever. Um, so we came up with the human resources and with my team in the last two years. Um, we started mobility earlier. So we started a few years ago and there was not, um, I would say, an equality system. So since we have the team in place, since about two years, um, we are able to have the human resources um, to provide these opportunities in apprenticeship. Um, usually when I talk about apprenticeship scheme at Software One, um, I talk a lot about the German system because this is usually our pilot project everywhere. We start with Germany because I'm based in Germany and then we spread it to other countries um, according to the national laws and the national um, obligations, which I think suits pretty well with the poll we had at the beginning um, because they're also the um, people in the call today said it's difficult to have the right employees um, in place to set these opportunities. So this might be the first challenge to have the right personnel in place um, to implement those pro projects. Um, the second thing I see here from an employer side is um, kind of a paradox on between having an overload of information at the one side and not having enough information on the other side. <laughs> Um, so when you start um, having a deep dive into mobility, there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of questions from a lot of people um, at the employer side. So there's the apprentice on the one side, there is the um, educational school on the other side, there might be your human resources department, there might be the tech mentors, there might be the general managers of the company, and you have to kind of get all these stakeholders um, in one place. So this is um, a journey we took over the last uh, years and we still take it. And 
we kind of wanted to have everybody on board and the commitment of everybody so that the apprentices feel supported in their journey in the mobility program. So what we did um, was we reached out to our whole um, human resources business partners in the region of EMEA. Um, we have several business partners that take care of every country so that we have our local partners on board and we reached out to our service line managers. Um, so maybe to give you a little insight about Software One, um, we are a global company, as I said, and we have different service lines. Let's start maybe with the cloud, um, cloud service sector. And we always reach out to the um, service line leader so that we have the commitment from the very top and they can escalate it from the top if there is any difficulty. So this is one of the main challenges um, to communicate the right things to the right people and have everybody on board, I would say. And that's that that those are issues with it. You organize this within your own company, don't you? So you're you're sending people on mobility experiences in other countries to other branches of the company. Is that that's yes. right, isn't it? Yeah, yes, yeah. That's and, right. And um do the people may, may I ask if you're uh, the people who are responsible within Software One for the mobility uh, process, if you like. Um, are they dedicated to that task? Are they part of an HR department? How, I think people might be interested in how that's that's kind mm -hmm. of organized. Yes. Um, so as I said, we have our um, global talent team, which is uh, uh, nine people, and I'm part of this talent team. And we are taking all the topics for mobility, for apprenticeship, for young juniors that are joining the company. Um, so this is a small team in our people and culture or old HR department, as you call it. Um, so it sits within the people and culture area. Yes. Hmm. And and you and what sort of skills do you look for people to to be involved in this sort of mobility side of things? Passion, <laughs> um, definitely <laughs> passion. Um, so the soft the soft skills as much as anything else. Yes, yes, yes. because you, you you can learn technical skills, and this is always what we say. Also, um, the people we hire, we can learn technical skills, um, but you mm. need to have a certain drive, a certain passion um, mm. to the topic, and then you can develop the program itself. I think I think Suzanne, you're nodding at nodding at that as well. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, completely. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> and I also completely agree with uh, what Lena said about uh, we have a lack of information at the same time and too much information on uh, uh, yeah at the same time. Uh, and and what we also really uh, observe is that it's really difficult to process the information within companies. You have maybe on the one hand a, a very motivated trainer of an individual apprentice who is really willing uh, to help them to go abroad and to to placement abroad. But there is maybe somebody in the HR department or at the management uh, department and they do not come together. And this is why communication about benefits and experiences also within the company is so important, I would say. Mm. Yeah, so so you need people with uh, soft navigation skills as well. I guess <laughs> if you did one of those sort of like Belbin tests, people, you would want diplomats, wouldn't you, who'd be coming out of that, people with yeah. those sort of, yes, to be and able to chart your way subtly through um you know this this situation people information and all the rest of it yeah and you need time and patience <laughs> yes yes take some time to implement yeah things. yeah indeed um i would just uh, subpoena i'd like to bring you in uh, at this point and uh, and see what what is what are the experiences um that you can you can share with us um uh, in in these kind of areas um or, or generally speaking uh, what do you what do you see as the main challenges Many, many, many. <laughs> I can, I think I can talk about challenges for a very long time, but I'll try to to be brief and uh, also share some of the of the results from sort of a of a research we conducted to also uh, ask directly the apprentices uh, uh, what their cha what challenges did they face personally. So just uh, again to quickly introduce myself, um, you can call me Pina as well. My name is uh, very easy to pronounce for Italians, very hard to pronounce for anyone else. Um, and um, I um, work at OBESU, which is the organizing bureau of European School Student Unions. So we work on uh, school level at secondary level uh, to represent and empower school students, including vocational learners. And as part of uh, our organization years ago, together with other organizations in um, at European level as well as at national levels, we started working to create 
um, a network of apprentices because we felt this need to sort of like network uh, apprentices themselves and give them a space because very often they are in this limbo, whether they're workers, whether they're students, uh, who should represent them, um, the different systems, different representation methods. And so together also with the commission, uh, we started to, to, to see, okay, there is a need to represent the apprentices more. How can we do it without themselves? So we started creating this network, which has been going now for quite, uh, well, for some years. Uh, um, and uh, together with Obesto and with the network and with other European organizations, last year, uh, we launched um, a survey, actually part of the, um, um, Erasmus uh, in uh, Schools project, which is an, an Erasmus Plus uh, funded project uh, um, on uh, on mobility, where we wanted to find out a bit what do uh, what are actually the challenges uh, for uh, vocational learners and secondary students uh, to uh, and apprentices uh, to join. Um, uh, a mobility uh, experience uh, that we defined uh, as a public uh, funded uh, mobility experience. So an Erasmus Plus funded uh, mobility or um, yeah, a European Solidarity Corps volunteering, etc. So we we looked at uh, those sort of mobilities and not specifically, for example, at company programs that are funded by companies um, themselves. Uh, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Uh, actually, the the number the challenge number one uh, was access to information. So, fifty three percent of the people that we um, surveyed uh, um, were not aware of uh, international mobility opportunities, uh, um, which to us uh, was initially surprising. And then, looking at the the, the composition of the um, of the respondents, uh, let's say, court, we realized um, that it, it was actually uh, it made a lot of sense because out of the one thousand five hundred people that responded. Around 850 were apprentices or vocational learners. Uh, actually, 750 were um, apprentices and only around 100 were vocational learners. And they were also uh, the majority of the people that did not uh, that did say that they did not have information uh, concerning um, mobility. Where they had information, this came especially from the schools and from the families. Um, and this was also some of, the, in a way, the problem that we saw, <laughs> uh, because then in the, the, the problem is that the majority of schools or training centers or uh, let's say uh, companies that uh, for, for what the, the respondents uh, replied, um, very few of them had specific uh, mobility um, let's say people that were responsible for international mobility that had the opportunity, the time and the resources to share the information widely with everyone, uh, considering also the very different personal uh, background that apprentices have when they're approaching mobility. Um, and another interesting uh, challenge, I mean, of other challenges that uh, we we mentioned, uh, the some of the biggest ones, and I think actually, the biggest, uh, the biggest one, even maybe more than information for students, was the financial support for families. So while we agree, for example, Jacqueline in the beginning mentioned, uh, indeed, uh, there is not only a need for more funding uh, uh, for, uh, for to make mobility a reality, a more widespread reality, uh, but there is also a need for funding and for social inclusion, uh, let's say, specific funding. Um, and then they also mentioned the financial support for, for institutions, the administrative burden. A lot of people were worried about their linguistic competencies, the recognition of the skills they learned abroad. Um, and uh, there was also a lot of people that mentioned resistance from families, um, especially lower income uh, families or, or families in which uh, there was no history of, uh, of mobility and for which the added value of mobility was not necessarily clear. Um, and speaking of added value of mobility, this is maybe also an interesting, uh, last interesting touch. I also uh, saw this on the toolkit uh, that, uh, you know, there is mention of um, how mobilities can help uh, finding a job more easily or being more attractive on the labor market. According to our research to apprentices, very, very few of them see this as an added value. They really do not uh, mention, um, they don't necessarily agree that I mean, going on a mobility opportunity can help them find a job more easily. However, they widely agree on the fact that going on a mobility is an incredible added value to learn new skills and to learn something more about other cultures. Um, which I think it's an interesting aspect when mm -hmm. we talk about how to make it more attractive for companies. 
um, and also how to, you know, how to, what sort of communication do we need to uh, have towards apprentices uh, on to what is the reason why they should go on a mobility opportunity, on a mobility experience. But these were some of the challenges. Uh, mm, and uh, yeah. That's, that's really interesting, that information, I think. And it, so it seems that apprentices, uh, they, they, they tick the box of like personal development as, as a benefit, but not less so the sort of, yeah, the employment side of things, uh, which is interesting, isn't it? Uh, um, very interesting, and it, it affects the whole, as you say, the whole way in which you would pitch things to, uh, to to people, um, and raise awareness and so on. Um, Su Suzanne, how does that um, moving on to the this apprentice this side of things? The um, what? Does, Sorry, does Andrew, she... just to jump yes, in, Flavia. we have lots Hello. of I did, questions. I, did, I, I saw you come in, didn't know whether to. Oh, you got a question, right? Yes, we cool. have uh, lots of questions in the in the chat, so I thought I'd share uh, some of the comments that are being made in the in the chat, given that I know that you don't have access to uh, yeah. to what people are saying, because a lot of the questions that have popped up are actually relevant, I think, to the uh, to the panelists and to what have, has been said so far. So I just wanted to share some of those. Uh, there's many, so I don't know to what extent we can address all of them. But yes, there's um, uh, a question about arguments that can be used to convince companies to host apprentices just for a short period of uh, of time. Uh, so I think that's a good one for uh, for Lena and 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 for Suzanne. Um, there's a question about uh, yeah, we've been already touched upon benefits uh, of uh, of mobility uh, from the side of apprentices, but then uh, participants were wondering about also benefits for companies. So uh, what are the again convincing arguments to to promote um, mobility? Um, yeah, uh, any arguments to support SMEs, particularly to uh, perhaps invest uh, in uh, in apprenticeship mobility. Um, and then if you know of any uh, quality frameworks to uh, assess the uh, the quality of intermediary organizations or partners that can be involved in uh, in mobility uh, opportunities. So, um, so yeah. So these are just a few of the of the questions that have uh, that have come up, and some are directly uh, addressed to some of the panelists. So maybe you can have a chat, have a look at the at the questions yourself, and reply when when you get a chance later. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yet, yeah, uh, well, that's the the very interesting questions. Suz Suzanne, yeah. is there anything in there that you would like to? Uh, pick yeah, up on it, yeah, sure. all of them. <laughs> uh, I saw this question about the benefits. Uh, uh, first of all. Um, um, for sure, w when we talk about the ben benefits, I would like to start um, on the sending side, how to convince companies to send an apprentice uh, abroad, because in our context, it's it's really it's really difficult missing workforce and part of the apprenticeship training. And then the person is not here. You have to pay this person that is abroad. And what is in then for the company that sends an apprentice abroad? Um, and I have maybe some arguments on the one side there is this personal and uh, professional development and I, I would like to come back to what Giuseppina said uh, that the personal development is is in the uh, is the main thing that the, the, the apprentices see um, themselves and and I can fully support that from our perspective um, it's probably due to the fact that most of the of the training periods abroad are short-term mobilities it's not the long-term mobility whether the professional development is so much in the focus of the of the of the mobility stay abroad but it's more the personal development and when I try to convince a, a, a sending company, an apprenticeship company in Austria about, about uh, mobility and say, yeah, you get back uh, uh, the people, uh, young people with personal development, they say, yeah, that, that, that's, that's nice. Sure, this is nice. This is something that is nice, but this is not uh, probably too soft as an argument and not, probably not enough to convince a company to, to send an appre uh, apprentice abroad. Um, the next step then is, for me, this motivates people it, uh, to give them uh, the feeling to to show them appreciation, to 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 give them kind of uh, feeling that they are they have some some value for the company. You send them broad appreciation uh, is maybe a, a a thing that is uh, um, easier to understand for companies, but 
right now at the moment it's a bit easier for us in general because we have a lack of uh, skilled workers we have a, a decreasing number of uh, people starting apprenticeship training starting vocational education uh, and training in austria and when you talk to companies they are really asking for something that how some 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 tools how they can get apprenticeship beginners and skilled workers and when i tell them um maybe you have to offer something to the young people offer them something that is also available for university students a mobility experience go abroad collect your experiences in another country uh, look at outside the box reflect on things and then come back and this is something i offer to you um, uh, i always hear from companies that they have apprenticeship beginners that decided to start an apprenticeship training in their company because of this offer, because of the, the, the thing that is um, the, the value of VET is the same as of gen general education. And um, you can, as a company, maybe also find employees to your company when you offer them things like that. It's also maybe interesting for bigger companies to prepare international careers, maybe do some testing, how, who is interested, um, what about their performance when they go abroad. And just to give them examples of companies uh, who already see the value. I have just, just one short, um, this is the, the rail cargo um, company in Austria, and they sent their apprentices abroad during the, the, uh, the period of apprenticeship training, and they sent them to partner organizations. So, um, and when they come back and do their presentations about the mobility experience, they, they tell the audience what they saw and that they understand now the processes in their own company in Austria. Why maybe sometimes a train is too late, why the forms uh, do not work in their specific context, what they need to change. So this is maybe an argument for bigger companies, maybe for companies that are in a kind of international relation with, with other companies or with uh, partners, uh, producers in other co uh, countries. But um, I think with this argument to, to motivate people to, to start an apprenticeship training, uh, you can reach also the smaller ones. This is my experience from, from the last two or three years about apprenticeship mobility. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I, that's that's very interesting. And aren't, aren't we touching upon these big issues around like how, as you say, how apprenticeships are perceived against, you know, like a university education and, you know, in someone goes to university, then, it, you know, going on an Erasmus thing is is now it's part of the fabric, isn't it? And also when you go to university, people see it as like, a you know, well, it's a personal development opportunity, whereas apprenticeships are seen in this much more kind of instrumental kind of way. This is, you know, you will learn how to be a bricklayer and lay bricks, but actually it's not about that at all. It's like you, you, it's a whole load of other things as well. And it's about how we we perceive skills too. Uh, Lena, have you got any any uh, comments, reflections on that? You're nodding away, so I'd like to give you the floor. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, again, a lot of relation to the things that Suzanne said. Um, I wanted to pick up one point, which is um, starting the mobility part of the apprenticeship already in the hiring process. Um, so this also comes back to a question we have later on in the panel discussion, but I think it suits uh, pretty well in here. Um, so we try to integrate these sending apprentices abroad program um, already in the hiring process and set it as a USP when we have this uh, employer branding fact. Um, so which I think is a great opportunity and a great benefit for companies um, to say, hey, I'm a company that can send apprentices abroad and we can give you this opportunity and we have plan X, Y, Z and we have a quality insurance and we can, yeah, go to this thing together. So this is what I wanted to add here. Um, it's a great chance for companies and it was a great chance for us. And right now we started um, implementing or having the mobility opportunities in the hiring um, phase for apprentices. We realized that we attract the people who want to go abroad. So it's kind of like a magnet. Um, when you start um, putting it in, um, yeah, the the hiring phase, um, you will attract apprentices that want to go abroad. So it's a match for the company. And this is a great benefit I see in here. Um, again, you need to um, distinguish between different companies because for every company, it's a different thing. Um, for us, um, mobility is a 
great opportunity because we are an international company. We already have these uh, international contacts and we have across na national teams. Um, so it was just a matter of time when we send apprentices abroad because we are already working cross nationals. Um, so it strengthens a lot um, the company goals we have as well. And this is what I think is very important that the mobility program you offer um, goes with your company goals because um, it's it's really um, a waste of time and a waste of resources if you put so much effort in it and the company is not supporting it with the goals itself. This is what we figured out. Thanks very much. Um, I can actually see chat messages now as they're pinging up. Um, but um, and uh, I was going to ask, Pina, you re you replied to a question. Was that to Jacqueline Paco's question? Or maybe it was another yes. question. It was, yes. No, it so was yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask that, uh, ask you, Jacqueline, ask if, if you've, you have all, uh, dear panellists, uh, participated in the public consultation. Yeah, uh, indeed. For, and I, I wanted to be sure that, that our panellists today have, have already contributed to the, the open public consultation. But I understand it is the case for the few of you, right? Thumbs up okay. or thumbs down? <laughs> Yes, Super. yes, okay. yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, Pina, well, I'll I'll come back to you after the um uh, when we get to the second part of the discussion round. But in order to uh, to keep on track, um, uh, I I now I I would like to present to you um some uh parts of the um the toolkits that uh that have been uh been developed and um our first session there was looking at um kind of the the sort of um, getting into uh, apprent the uh, mobility periods and and the implementation phases, which are kind of like the first two uh, parts of the um, uh, of of the sort of mobility process, if you like. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we um, yeah, just to introduce the toolkits. Um, toolkits, in fact, plural, because we have one targeted at apprentices and uh, one targeted at uh, vet providers and um, companies. Um, the um, they're literally hot off the press, if you can use that expression these days. Um, the, um, the the mobility of apprentices toolkit is is um, is has been finalised, and the other one for vet providers and companies is literally at the sort of formatting um, stage, making it look uh, very nice and presentable. And within these toolkits overall, uh, we, we, we the space is dedicated to um, some of the sort of key key concepts underpinning uh, mobility. Uh, there's an overview of the EU uh, policies and funding instruments. Uh, we also provide provide step by step guidance, which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. And there are also in there some inspiring examples uh, that hopefully uh, will um, motivate and uh, and stimulate people to get involved uh, and to and in in mobility and also to to hopefully guide them um, or to make improvements to how mobility processes uh, are carried out. Uh, there's also um, some checklists within there. So just to zoom in on um, how we've unpacked um, what we're calling the mobility journey. Next slide, please. Uh, we've seen this as, as kind of three phases uh, or the, if you like, the three eyes of, of mobility, uh, initiation, implementation and, and integration. Uh, phases and these these are all uh, these are all vi the, of the same importance really they're like kind of links in a chain um, and and if you see if you get one part uh, as right as you can it's more likely the next part will also be uh, as right as you can get it and and so on down the chain um, and um, making sure that each of these parts um, works well um, uh, is is it critical to getting the sort of mobility process to flow as smoothly as possible. Uh, in the initiation phase, that's all about getting ready for mobility experience and, and how to lay the ground for a successful mobility uh, period. Uh, the implementation phase is when uh, an apprentice goes on a mobility um, uh, a mobility, mobility period abroad, that when they take part in the placement um, and um, uh, the key issues there are around how to to best manage and support uh, the placement. We've heard about some of that in the discussion just now. And the final step is is what we call integration, which is like how in I suppose integration in two senses: how you make sure that the the skills and competencies that people have um, acquired during the mobility period is kind of integrated into their um, uh, on, on a sort of practical level into their CVs, but in, into kind of their own sort of professional kind of and personal development. 
um, and then how those those are actually uh, presented um, to the wider world, how they're recognised and validated and so on. Uh, and that's all about sort of maximising the benefits of mobility. So those are the kind of three sta stages that we've divided the toolkit into. And just to give you a flavour for uh, the, um, the stages individually, uh, I won't go into these in too much detail because I think uh, um, uh, you, you can go away and look at the documents and uh, uh, we, I think you probably would like to hear more from our panellists than me talking about the details of the guide. But next slide, please. So the initiation stage, uh, we have here uh, the apprentices on the left hand side, vet, provider vet providers and companies on the other side. And uh, as far as initiation is concerned, we deal with um, identifying the mobility experience. Um, as, as Pina said, um, there's an important issue here about um, how people, how apprentices actually perceive um, uh, mobility experiences and what they can offer. Uh, the second element here is about uh, the mobility agreement, which is kind of the linchpin of any mobility exchange, and that should talk about the roles and responsibilities and uh, the learn have the learning plan and the learning outcomes. Uh, and the final part in this section for apprentices uh, is all about familiarising yourself with the host country and company. Um, and that's sort of formal things about sort of housing arrangements, but also in and language development, and also informal things about learning about the culture of the country. And I think throughout this, it's important to emphasise there are kind of those informal aspects on the one hand and informal aspects, but they're both equally important for um, a successful mobility period. As far as vet providers and companies are concerned, um, there's more on this side, which is might might be. Um, uh, inevitable in a sense because there's there's more to do for the vet providers and companies in terms of again getting started with the opportunities understanding uh, legal obligations uh, is vital as as was already flagged up in the poll um, it's also about building partnerships and again in the panel discussion we heard about the the, the large number of stakeholders that have to be navigated um, around mobility exchange uh, there's the mobility learning agreement uh, itself uh, there's also preparing apprentices for their mobility experiences, um, not just welcome packs as mentioned here, um, but you know introducing people early on to who their supervisors will be, who their mentor might be, who they'll be working with their working environment. That's all important too. Uh, and there's also this important issue of developing professional um, staff skills. It's, go it's good to see that um, the headings in here reflect some of the uh, aspects in the poll that came out earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Then we're on to implementation uh, and on the apprentice side, uh, this is about understanding rights and obligations and resolve and uh, also um, having provision in place for resolving disputes that will inevitably uh, arise um, in certain circumstances. Uh, we can't assume everything will just be uh, smooth all the time. Uh, there's also the aspect of making the best out of a mobility experience through uh, both social and, and professional integration. Uh, this point about the, the formal and the formal informal aspects. There's also the uh, working with companies and vet providers to achieve uh, the learning uh, objectives themselves um, by working closely with supervisor mentors, um, using uh, systems to track progress, that type of thing. And on the vet provider company side, uh, we have um, the onboarding experience, if you like, for apprentices um, in organising informal get togethers, social ga gatherings, as well as language culture, uh, language courses um, and other sorts of tailored um, support, helping kind of apprentices with a socialisation experience. Uh, there's also the important aspect of, of getting to know the apprentice. Uh, and this is a whilst um, the, the hosting organisation will have seen um, got to know the apprentice through CVs and that type of thing. Um, it's important, as we've also heard before, about how they fit into the organisation they're going to be doing their mobility experience in. So evaluating their competencies more broadly is also important. Um, the third point here is about continuous communication uh, between the partners. Um, now we're all used to uh, Teams uh, when it works and Zoom and other methods like that. There's no excuse, I think, anymore for, for not to keep in touch on a regular basis. Uh, and finally, uh, in this section, um, making sure that the apprentice is supported throughout their stay is really important. 
and you, you can do that in various ways by having mentors or, or setting up a buddy system uh, involving where they work closely with someone um, uh, actually in their in the workplace uh, at one of their peers if you like so that's that's the kind of um, just to give you a flavor really for what's in the uh, the, the toolkits, um, which you'll be able to access in the link, um, which was provided in the slide earlier. So that's the um, initiation and implementation uh, phases. The last phase of this is, is integration. And I guess that brings us on to um, the last part of our, our panel discussion. Um, and again, we have another, another poll for you. Uh, and um, I'm very delighted to call on my, my, my very able assistant, Flavia, um, uh, to to help me with this, um, to provide you with, um, to guide you through the the links and so on and so forth. But here, the question uh, we would like to ask, which I think is on a slide, perhaps. No, it's in the chat, isn't it? Is um, how can we ensure mobility becomes a long term feature uh, of apprenticeships, meaning that it becomes uh, Im embedded um, into the sort of mainstream part of of um, uh, of the apprentice, apprenticeship experience and we've given you four choices four options here and you have I believe two choices is that that's right Flavia isn't it and again uh, once you've voted you need to just click the the, the box uh, to turn it off but I think that's straightforward so we'll yes. just give you a few minutes to answer that I'm monitoring the, the replies just giving thank you we need some back, we need some nice background music, don't we? <laughs> I, I will not sing that I can oh, tell okay. you. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I can already see uh, some clear preference in terms of uh, the the replies. So uh, the response that is getting the most votes for now is embedding the mobility possibilities in national bet frameworks um, as the uh, the key element. And that's followed by easy recognition and validation of competences acquired abroad. Uh, these seem to be the two that are getting the, the most vote, but actually uh, things are slightly changing uh, while uh -huh. people uh, vote because now we have an equal amount of votes also for, um, so as a second choice, for developing and supporting VET partnerships across um, Europe. So, mm. um, so yeah. Embedding mobility in VAT frameworks, uh, recognition and validation of competences, and uh, developing and supporting VAT partnerships are the 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 options with the most uh, choice. But then again, mm. the, the the fourth option, developing and supporting intermediary intermediary organisations and other key players, uh, is. Uh, a close fourth option. So I think the, the votes are uh, equally distributed with um, embedding mobility in VET frameworks as the, the one that really stands out as the key priority. Mm. And I guess those those priorities are also the sort of challenges that we have there for, because if they're people's priorities, then actually you can see that the recognition um, uh, is, is an, is, remains an issue, uh, and as does embedding the uh, mobility in in within national um, frameworks uh, which includes of course qualification frameworks um that's really thank you very much everyone for voting um pina maybe i can give the floor to you for uh, to, to start our kick off our second round of discussions um where um again we're starting with challenges quest questions um so thinking about the um the final stage of uh, of mobility uh, and it's fair to say, I mean, I, I was involved in the EC VET uh, team in the UK in the good old days, and um, uh, you you could you could see how this this was almost like the bit at the end, the last stage where where people like you you've gone on your mobility experience, you've come back, and you can restart your course, <laughs> and uh, and it was uh, and there was very little in some places very little gathering of of. Of what people had learned from that at, at, uh, in their experience, what their mobility experience. So it's really important that we um, we now try and um, develop ways of of capturing the skills people have acquired, and so that they can promote them to other uh, people. Um, Pina, what's what's your reflections on that particular topic? I uh, I think uh, the only way really to make uh, mobility become a long term feature of apprentices is if we don't see this as the last stage, but rather like a step to the beginning of the circle again, 
like it's a sort of a cycle for me and it's not necessarily the same person although it might be because people can go on a mobility experience several times in their life and potentially they should and they will i don't know how the the labor market will shape it itself to be do i do this do you hear me better sorry yeah i do i couldn't hear you but i could uh, see you doing... okay sorry um so just to say like um if we see it a bit more as a cycle where the beginning of the next cycle is not necessarily the same person. I mean, it could be the same person and it should at some point in their lives be the same person, but it should be this person empowering someone else. So for us, uh, maybe what I want to focus on a bit right now is not necessarily how they can um, make visible the skills they acquired in the company. I know that's extremely relevant, but there are people that are more expert than, than, than me on that, but rather how can they use those skills that they acquired and especially all the soft skills, those competencies, those attitudes that change their lives uh, um, to empower other apprentices to go on a mobility. And this is actually the, um, the main uh, element of what we have developed also again in the Erasmus in Schools project that Erasmus Student Network has been doing for many years on academic level. And now we're trying to see also how we can do it on vocational and apprenticeship level, which is the peer interventions and the use of peer learning and peers um, sort of like um, com the discussion and the contamination to um, involve uh, and to make mobility become a reality for someone else. Um, so someone that has gone on a mobility would come back and not only share what they have learned with the company, which indeed is extremely, as I said, relevant, um, but uh, also to share them with the other people who have not been on a mobility, who are resistant to go on a mobility, who are scared. Because also a lot of people, a lot of apprentices are scared to go on a mobility because they are scared of what they're going to find when they come back. This is the same between apprentices and people at the secondary level, at the school student level, because they are afraid of the impact on their performance at work at the, at work or at school um, and I think that's extremely relevant and maybe for that what we need is also to make it um, to make this uh, um, let's say uh, integration uh, more uh, successful and we need more companies to switch their mindset to what uh, Lena was talking about before so rather focusing on soft skills so not what have you learned in terms of technical skills which indeed they might have learned something very new very specific to their new company or the new country but what have you learned about the place you've been to? What have you learned about your own resilience, your own, um, you know, sort of like uh, entrepreneurship uh, or any other competence that they could have developed going abroad? And how can those be at use in our company? So also not only focusing on the on the technical skills, but also on the more uh, wide competencies. Um, and I think for those, those are especially relevant for shorter mobilities. And I think short-term mobilities are indeed extremely relevant to make long-term impact in mobility in apprenticeships. I think if people, it's very hard to find someone that is ready to go. I think Susan was mentioning it before, too ready to go on a long-term mobility, go um, and come back unchanged. I mean, that's that's uh, maybe not uh, the, the first thing that's... Uh, that people would want to go to, but there is a high chance that people would go on a short-term mobility, come back, feel enriched, and then go on a long-term mobility. And I think maybe that's what we should be uh, striving for if we really want to make sure that the uh, mobility becomes a reality, because that's what happens at university level also. People that go on an Erasmus don't necessarily go for the longest period of time immediately, unless they've had already before, a short term, a shorter term. So a lot of people do, for example, a six term, a six months mobility in their bachelor and a one year mobility in their masters or um, a short term mobility in their school level at the secondary school. And then they do a one year mobility in their bachelor. This is something we need to um, to remember um, and also really use this. I think one of the so developing and supporting intermediary organization and other key players, I think that's extremely relevant to ensure sustainability. Um, mobility organizations uh, or organizations of learners like us, we can really help um, in making the added value of the mobility visible um, and also in using that richness to involve more people. So that's something that uh, um, I think it's important. I will share in the chat uh, the 
link to our memento on uh, peer interventions that can be interesting also like how to do a peer intervention we are going to develop a training a toolkit on that as well um, and i will also share this uh, which is also in your uh, in your toolkit it's a passport uh, mobility passport um, and it's the peer to peer information on um, so it's easy to understand peer to peer information pocket size on how to go on a uh, mobility which uh, scheme to choose etc it's a bit in your presentation andrew and i think that's again the richness of each other's contribution and the richness of i mean already in the comments i've seen another two erasmus plus projects on vet and mobility and um, that's all richness that can help us make uh, um, impact in the long term uh, hopefully we manage to put it all at work together and uh, make a you know a big explosion of uh, <laughs> support to to mobility in apprenticeships Thanks very much, Pina. I love the idea that it uh, is not only is it not just the final stage, but it's actually the beginning of another stage. <laughs> and you have these cycles, not just for individuals, but actually they then become the people who will promote the idea to other people. And I think it's really important you're reminding as well of 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 all the the uh, the thoughts that people have, apprentices have about mobility periods you know fear of missing out the fomo side of things about you know what's what's going to happen you know if i'm especially if i'm away for weeks and weeks uh, back in the workplace it's really difficult isn't it yeah thanks for highlighting that and also for the practicalities of your your guide your your, your document uh suzanne do you want to uh, comment on these these uh interesting subjects Definitely, there is not so much more to add because uh, I think despite the fact that we come from different perspectives and different backgrounds, the points that are, are mentioned are quite the same. Uh, I mm. mean, for me too. And also the idea of this cycle or kind of circle uh, um, is, is is also also relevant for us. We did develop something a bit like this toolkit. Um, um, it's it's quite similar. We developed some coaching material in Austria, which is uh, especially focusing on, on the role of the companies. And um, um, the experience that we made with all this material is, uh, is so much information. And in we have six modules in this coaching material, so much information. And um, when we pass the information simply to the to the companies, this is not enough. Uh, there are still so many questions open, and so we we came up to offer some workshops for them and to individual coaching, personal coaching, visit them and and use uh, this kind of uh, material and coaching material then as a kind of script afterwards uh, that we pass to them uh, or send it to them online. It's both available in paper and also uh, online, but. This coaching material, the six, six modules are the first modules are about the module is about the benefits, and the last module is about the sustainability. And this is for us also the same. It's it's a kind of a circle. You have to convince about the benefits, and after, at the end you have to to implement uh, the experience, especially the personal experience, whatever uh, happened during this uh, period via presentations, via social media activities, via um, uh, maybe there is a chance to have some context to, to newspapers, to uh, whatever media is is available, and um, and and then reach maybe the next generation of potential mobility participants, um, uh, and and um, yeah, show them firsthand uh, experiences that the peers that have already uh, gone abroad made uh, in another country. When we're talking about Andrew about the qualification framework. Mm. We made the experience that uh, this uh, is still not really known uh, and not so relevant for the Austrian companies. It's more for the training centers, for the school sector, uh, also in the vet sector, uh, but not so much interesting for the, the the companies. They still do not know what it is about and what the, um, they can do with it. But um, what we also experienced is that um, when we have uh, kind of mobility experiences uh, and especially Erasmus mobility experiences, because this is a known, this is a kind of trademark. Uh, meanwhile, also in the field of apprenticeship mobility, uh, to have this as a part of kind of quality charters in different um, uh, pathways of uh, uh, vocational education and training, and also especially in apprenticeship training. 
And there's one more thing that I would like to mention. We have an um, an award, a kind of label that we created in a, in an Erasmus Plus KA2 project together with uh, partners from France, uh, Spain, uh, Denmark and Iceland, um, where we want to have, um, well, we want to award companies who do really great job in this uh, apprenticeship mobility field. And we want to, to kind of showcase them and, and give them the opportunity, give them the floor to present about their experiences. And this is really, really used in Austria. It's uh, this kind of label, it's called Equamop, um, European Quality Assurance in uh, Mobility. And um, uh, this is um, given to the, the the companies by the Austrian in, in Austria by the federal minister of economy uh, of economy which is really a great thing and the kind of ceremony and they the companies uh, really like to to use this as a kind of presenting themselves to the public and what they do great and on the other hand to exchange with other companies uh, about their experiences uh, and use the floor of the ceremony. This is something that we should really keep in mind that uh, showcasing uh, best practice examples need some platforms, need some 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 floor, some some yeah maybe places on social media and wherever what is possible. And uh, coming back to this recognition thing, I mean we are in a very very lucky situation in Austria. We have. Uh, um, in the Austrian um, law, there is a, a paragraph where um, where it's written down and valid for every apprentice in and every apprenticeship company all over all, all over Austria that uh, um, ex collecting experiences abroad in your professional field is um, recognized as part of apprenticeship training in Austria up to six months a year. And this is very, very unbureaucratic. It's just one certificate that you have to send. And uh, usually we do that at the IFA because we are the funding the most of the apprenticeship uh, mobility uh, participants. So we do that for them. and. Um, this is really, I, I think this is a really comfortable situation according to, to uh, the recognition because there is no prolongation, no interruption of apprenticeship training. And I think this is important for, I, I mean, maybe some companies would wish it the other way around, go abroad and then we make a stop and I don't, I don't have to pay for you. But uh, it's a really good position for the apprentices that they can go abroad and this is recognized. And uh, Coming to the company side, there is some national funding for the apprenticeship income, which is also maybe some Austrian specific uh, thing, but also very motivating for companies to send apprentices abroad that they get the income they have to pay to the apprentices back from the state uh, after the return. Uh, and uh, with those two things, we make the experience that um, yeah, there is no no argument uh, for companies uh, yeah to say no, it's too expensive. <laughs> Missing workforce yeah. is still a topic, but uh, it's not the money. Yes, you have quite a model there in Austria, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm yeah, sure lots of people will be looking at that very um, jealously at the moment, but. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Lena, would you like to come in for some, I guess, some final comments on, on this, this this final phase? Yeah. Of course. Um, so I wanted to pick up the first question again, um, what challenges we have as employers uh, to showcase the skills. And I wanted to, again, uh, state the difference between the technical and hard skills, like Pina said, and um, the so-called soft skills. Um, because for the technical skills, it's rather easy to showcase them because you have certain KPIs you can measure and you can report back to the business. Um, a challenge I had when I first sent apprentices abroad was um, to tell my general managers, to tell my leaders um, what were the skills that they have been developed. So it's a kind of reporting issue um, to report to your managers, to report to your um, business partners, what are the benefits when they come back. Um, so what we did or what we are right up right now in Software One is we create kind of a pre and post assessment test for our apprentices where they can evaluate their um, soft skills um, in terms of how do I reflect to myself and how do I interact with other people. So there are two parts of it. Um, first, there is the part where you assess yourself um, and then the second part 
okay, I assess my um, abilities to talk to other people, to be confident, um, to come out of my way, and so on. Um, so this was a thing we um, yeah, brought as an example from Software One, uh, so these post and pre-assessment tests. And what we created, or what we're up to create, is a so-called success diary, uh, which we give the apprentices when they go abroad. Um, so they get a task from us. Um, they should have kind of a diary when they go abroad. It doesn't matter if it's in a written form, if it's in a picture form, if it's a video format, whatever, but just that they reflect on the journey and that they can tell the others, and there is the circle again, um, that they can report to others what they have been experienced once they get abroad. And this is also a thing of showcasing the skills. So these were the challenges we face and how we try to solve them. We're not um, at the end of the solution um, because you're always develop and you learn every year. Every year you send apprentices abroad, there's a new topic that's coming up. And I think this is also um, relating to the second question, how can we ensure that it becomes a long-term feature? Um, for us as a huge company, one of the main factors is to build um, the network, build the network uh, within the apprentices. Um, because we have apprentices in their third year, we have some in their first year, and we have so-called um, monthly topics um, where we bring all the apprentices together and we talk about certain topics. And one topic per quarter is always sending apprentices abroad. Um, so people who have been abroad talk about their experience and then there the circle closes and we have new apprentices and they can um, yeah, have the name, have the experience and so on. So this is great when you build um, the alumni network, let's say it this way. <laughs> yeah, quite right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Apprentice Mobility Alumni Network. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's, that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there was a question in the chat, which I'll take quickly um, with, with still watching the, our, our clock. Um, but uh, someone asked if the um, if there have been any investigations research into how mobility periods vary, uh, do they vary by sector in terms of their success? Is uh, have you um, ex any experience that some sectors are more successful in this than others? I'm not sure what factors that would be related to, and the answer can be no. <laughs> there hasn't been any research into that. Um, I I don't know about any any national research in Austria, but um, I know that we have uh, almost all branches uh, 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 in the mobility area. Maybe it's uh, easier for the the bigger companies for sure. That's 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 obvious. But there is one branch which is really underrepresented in our uh, experiences, which is uh, the tourism sector seems to be really complicated for them but maybe it's uh, just that we uh, we have a, a kind of natural mobility in this uh, in this sector that is not um, uh, performed by uh, the Erasmus program so uh, maybe the mobility is uh, at the same level as the as uh, in all the other branches but not in the especially not in the Erasmus program yeah, that, and, that, um, that would yeah. be paradoxical, wouldn't it? Yes, thank you. Yeah. You resolved it really well. Thank you. Yes, I think the natural side of it must come into play somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pina or uh, Lena, have you got any views on that at all? No. No. Okay. Well, I I should unfortunately I need to draw the panel discussion to a close. But uh, on behalf of everybody, I'm uh, thank you very much for your enthusiasm uh, and insights. Uh, and and also practical examples. I like the way in which we talked about the general subjects, but also we're very uh, in very concrete terms. So so thank you very much. Um, I I will now do just to, to to round off this 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 part of the uh, of the webinar. Uh, I've just got one more slide um, to show you uh, how we've kind of tried to capture the richness of what you're saying in it within within the toolkit. Um, and this is the last the last phase integration. Um, look smaller than the others because we only have two 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 steps on either side um uh, but uh, as we've said it's it's just as important as as the other sex other other steps uh, as far as apprentices are concerned um this is about the the showcasing and the processes involved around that uh, which is around you know as we've we've heard identifying and documenting uh, people's um, experiences and and the personal and professional development uh, the steps they've gone through and as part of that um, as you mentioned Lena 
um, you need to provide people with space to reflect on what those experiences um, actually have been. Um, there's also uh, this, the step of, of um, giving something back. Um, the uh, the idea of you know that there are alumni from mobility experiences and they have a lot to give other potential uh, 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 mobility uh, mobility participants. On the bet provider side, I, I think this just mirrors what I've just said on the apprentice side. Um, it's important that pro bet providers and companies. Um, organize assessments, um, take into account uh, the need for validation and what the, the the validation and recognition procedures are in there in the the uh, the sending uh, country, um, and they also need to take stock of the lessons learned. Um, and we we always finish with with monitoring evaluation, and this is no exception. It's important that um, there's opportunities to step back and consider. Um, what um, have been the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of any kind of mobility experience uh, over the course of time. Um, so that's that finishes um, really the, the the second part of the panel discussion. So many thanks again uh, to the three of you. And at this point, I would like to give the floor to uh, Luc Verne um, from uh, EuroApp uh, Mobility, uh, which is um, doing some great work um, that we would love to share with you. Uh, around the mobility of apprentices. So look, the, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, hello, uh, thank you, Andrew, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I, I will do two things, very shortly introduce you uh, EuroApp Mobility, but also uh, encouraging you to join the mobility uh, community of the European Alliance for Apprenticeship. So uh, EuroApp Mobility is a non-profit association and our focus is really to remove obstacles uh, of all kinds uh, in order to, to foster uh, international mobility. Uh, and we gather vet centers, companies, institutions uh, in, uh, around this common project uh, of the creation of a European space of apprenticeship and vocational learning. So that's uh, in this um, um, that we are involved in the mobility community of uh, European Alliance. And I would like to, to take the words of, uh, of Lena, who said that uh, mobility is a magnet. Uh, I, I hope that our community will be a magnet. If, uh, if you are not yet part of it, please join. Uh, it, it, it's quite important because we saw this morning that we have a, a big consensus on the fact that uh, mobility is an added value and all the soft skills are needed and they create attractiveness for apprenticeship uh, itself. Uh, and one key element is that to build on this consensus, there is another consensus and we saw it during the meetings that we have of the mobility community earlier this year, that there is a need to network and networking is really clear. We see that there is a strong push from the European Commission to help and to develop tools. And uh, I thank uh, as well uh, Anna and Jacqueline for their words uh, earlier th this morning. Um, so there are, there are tools. There is a toolkit now that is here, a very good one. Uh, thank you for the work uh, on that. What we need is to get to know uh, all uh, together uh, and to work together uh, in order to, to foster mobility. Now we have, we have high ambition and even higher ambition with the recommendation of the European Commission. Uh, and clearly in, um, in working together, we can achieve those ambition. So in very concrete terms, uh, when it comes to the mobility community, uh, the um, organization, people who are already part of the mobility community received an email from my colleague Clara Allegra, and I will put in the chat her email again uh, so that uh, you have it. If you did not respond it to, to her email, please do so. Uh, she is asking for uh, a few questions on you, which will help us in presenting uh, all the members of the community. Uh, and then building on the presentation, we will share, uh, we will share uh, some uh, some presentation communication tools in order to uh, to give visibility and a better understanding among all of us uh, of uh, who we are and how we can uh, work together uh, in 
uh, in this uh, mobility community and clearly 2023 was the first step and the recent recommendation of the committee uh, of the commission that will be now discussed in the council um, in the first half of uh, 2024 uh, will be a, a very important moment for all of us uh, to prepare the uh, the next step so that's for the mobility community I will not be uh, longer uh, we I also need to mention that we have a LinkedIn group uh, if you are not yet part of this LinkedIn group, you can join it. And these, these tools uh, will be some channels uh, in order for, uh, for all of us to, uh, to work together uh, around this, uh, um, uh, this strong belief uh, that, we, uh, that we share. And as Europe App Mobility, we have one belief is that when we, uh, when we really believe in a topic, there's no barriers uh, and uh, we can leave all the blockages and i think now we can uh, we can do that with the tools that we have uh, working together thank you very much luke uh, for sharing about uh, this really important initiative um, it, it comes to me to close now and again i'd just like to thank everybody who's taken part uh, anna and jacqueline for kicking off proceedings and our, our wonderful panelists uh, for sharing their their passion about this subject um, and only one one final remark for me I think is that um, uh, we, we have the mobility toolkit which was basically um, drawn on the experiences of, of people on like the people on our panel um, but uh, and it's a synthesis and a, and a sort of distillation really of of, of people's uh, knowledge and experience from the past but I think it's only part of the picture and I think uh, uh, as well as using the toolkit, you need to talk to people like Luke and Suzanne and Lena and Pina um, to to help um, enrich your experience of of how to do uh, really good quality uh, mobility experiences. So thank you for uh, your participation, and um, I guess watch the uh, AFA space for more webinars in the future. Many thanks indeed. <laughs>